second part of the book of Exodus. And today we're thinking about the third commandment of the Ten Commandments that you'll find in verse 7, though we'll read all the whole chapter. But let's read from Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. And the Lord spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it. Honour your father and your mother, that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbour. You shall not covet your neighbour's house. You shall not covet your neighbour's wife. Or his maid servant, or uh, man servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When the people saw the thunder and lightning, and heard the trumpets, and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself, and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us, or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, God has come to test you, so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sin. The people remained at that distance, while Moses approached in the thick darkness where God was. And the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites this, you have seen for yourselves that I have spoken to you from heaven. Do not make any gods to be alongside me. Do not make for yourselves gods of silver or gold, gods of gold. Make an altar of earth for me and a sacrifice on it, your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, your sheep and goats and your cattle. And wherever I cause my name to be honoured, I will come to you and bless you. If you make an altar of stones for me, do not build it with dressed stones, for you defile it if you use it for one. And do not go up to my altar on the steps, lest your nakedness be exposed. More than 25 years ago, there was this American pharmaceutical company, and it was searching for a name for their business. It needed to be distinctive, <clears throat> easy to remember, something that would clearly brand the company and give it an identity in the American market. Of course, they had no way to know then that the name that they had chosen would have such a negative effect on the American investors and the public perception in 2015. Today, ISIS pharmaceuticals are discovering one of the great truths at the heart of our passage, that names really matter. Today, we're thinking about the third command, Exodus 20, verse 7. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. And I want us to think about three things in this commandment. First of all, a definition. We will think about God's name. What does it mean? And then secondly, we'll think about our duty, both positive and negative. And then thirdly, we'll think about our destiny. These three things have been taught to us in this commandment. 
So first of all, we'll look at the definition of God's name. Until recently, very recently, the almost universally sung happy birthday, a song's happy birthday, was under copyright. So whenever it was sung on the television or radio or published in the newspaper, the royalties went to Warner Chapel Music, who owned the copyright from the original author. And there's a sense in which the third commandment is saying the name of God is under copyright, so that whenever you use it, we owe him royalties. We owe him honour. We owe him reverence and praise. And how we speak about them matters a very great deal. And in particular, when we understand what has been signified by the name of the Lord your God, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, we then think about what's in a name. Why is a name? Why is this particular name so important? The name of God in Scripture, like many of the names in the Bible, is much more than the label that we give it. You know, in New Zealand, generally speaking, our names, such as mine, Norman Turner, tells you nothing about my character or much about my history. Let's try it out. Norman Turner, what do you derive from that name? Anything. Probably European, Norman Turner. English speaking word of some sort. Yeah. Anything else? A wood turner, yes, Turner. Wood turner, yes, that's where it derives from. Okay, what about the first my first name? Norman Turner. And where's that? Somewhere in France, yeah. Um, yeah. Norman Conquerors, maybe something like that. Yeah. So that's all we get from my name. And it means Norman. North man, man from the north. But what about me? I'm not from the north, I'm from the southern hemisphere. I am English, Scottish, and some French, yes, a mixture of all. But no, it doesn't really tell me about my name, really. And Turner, no, haven't even touched the label in my lifetime. And in fact, you'd have to go back to my fifth great grandparent to have a builder in the family so. and I don't know much more about my history from the English, you know, English side so I can't tell you and my name doesn't reflect my heritage or me what I am, am I bad, am I good or am I going to turn into something, whatever so no, my name's no reflection of who I am, apart from you know it's me, me the person that you refer to but that's not the case with God, with the name of God. God's name is shorthand for his being and his work. And so that's God's name is a definition of God himself, who he is and what he's like and what he does. And it's a reminder to us that when we use his name, we are invoking more than just the label title that refers to some being in a distance from us. We are bringing to mind the attributes of God, the nature and being of God and his work. So, for example, when Moses met God on Mount Sinai back in Exodus chapter 3, God, God said to Moses from the burning bush, I am who I am. And he said, you're the same Israelites, I am, has sent me to you. And God also said to Moses, well, say to the Israelites, the Lord, for I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. I am who I am, which in Hebrew is contracted down to Yahweh which in our English Bibles it's translated as the word Lord, Lord written out in all caps. It's God's name. It's more than just a label, a name tag. It's a definition, a declaration of fundamental truths regarding his being and his nature. For he is eternal, self-sufficient, independent, 
uncreated God, the great I am. He is not prone to change. He is the one who is and who was and who is to come. I am. And so the name of God is shorthand for his being, his nature, his essence. And when you use it, you are invoking the, the full extensive collection of his attributes and the totality of his character and being. The name of God is also more than his being. It is also his saving work. In Psalm 106, verse 8, we are told God saved his people for his name's sake to make his mighty power known. Psalm 54, verse 1, the psalmist David, he prays, Save me, O God, by your name. Vindicate me by your might. Proverbs 18, verse 10, the name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. He is known by his name among the people who he is saved. These are two great themes, the being of God and the saving work of God that come together so wonderfully. And it also reflected in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. In John 8, verse 38, we learn that Jesus bears the name of God because he declared before Abraham was, I am. His own name, the name Jesus, means he will save his people from their sins. We read that in Matthew 1, verse 21. The name Jesus means Yahweh, the God who saves. That's his name. In Romans 18, verse 13, uh, 10, verse 13, the Apostle Paul quotes from the prophecy of Job. He says, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But the Lord there in the prophecy of Job is the word Yahweh. It's the divine name, the God who said, I am. Whoever calls on the name of Yahweh will be saved. But Paul has it in Romans 10, 13 as a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. The name of God, the name Yahweh, belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. Whoever calls on the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. He is the God who saves. There is no other name under heaven given amongst men by which we must be saved but this name, the name Jesus. Jesus is the one in whom we may know God, who is God in us. And when it's the name of God and the name of Christ, everything is in the name. When you misuse the name of God, when you use it casually or flippantly, when it comes from your mouth in anger and frustration, when you use it as a curse word, what are you doing? Shouldn't there be outrage or distress when we hear God's name so abused? The unspoken truth behind the third commandment is not just that Christians should not misuse the God's name. There's hardly anything more out of place for Christians to do that a Christian should misuse his holy name. The one we love the most, the one we profess to trust and adore, his name should never find a place as a curse word on our tongue. Rather, we should be in adoration or praise with his name. We need to understand that the name of God is unspeakably precious. And so we have the second point today, the Christian's duty towards the name of God. Now I want you to notice that when we're told here about our duty, first our duty positively, what we are to do, and then negatively what we're not to do, how to use and how not to misuse that divine name. First our duty positively, how to use God's name. In fact, it's a funny one because it's sort of like a negative positive. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. And it literally means to lift up as in the uh, King James, you shall not lift up the name of the Lord your God in vain. It's used in a legal context. In taking a vow, someone would lift up their hand and swear by the name of God in a way similar to the practice today where we swear an oath or tell the truth in court. You swear by the name of God. The phrase also appears in the context of worship. Psalm 63, verse 4, the psalmist says to God, I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. Psalm 134 calls on all people to lift up your hands to the in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. Whether it's in prayer or praise, 
and solemn oaths or vows, whatever, whenever, and by whoever, the name of God is invoked. There is in Scripture this universal expectation that it will be done in reverence and honour and in holy respect. And so the third commandment is much more than a prohibition and a warning. It's an invitation and a summons to take up God's name, to honour him and bring him glory. It's our duty to praise and to worship, not to stay away. And when we think about what God's name signifies, there should be joy in our hearts that moves us to praise. For as a child of God, the Father, we speak to him with intimacy. So there should be joy in our hearts. There should be also holy awe as the gravity of who God is. He's infinite. He's eternal. He's unchangeable in his being. He is wisdom. He is power. He is holiness. He is justice. He is goodness and truth. And as the weight of who God is, it presses upon us as we take up his name on our lips. It should ignite us in reverence and love. And it's in that experience, the third commandment is summoning all of us to come to him and to give him glory and take up his name with joy and gratitude. And that's what Jesus intended when we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who is, who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We want to honour his name. We want to give him glory because we know him as our Father. It's our delight. It's our duty that he's given us because of what he has done for us. And God is saying to us in this third commandment, take up my name and give him glory. Take up my name that signifies my majesty. Take up my name that speaks of the gospel. Take up my name that speaks of the nails in the Saviour's hands and feet. Take up my name and sing my praises. And so the third commandment calls us to the right use of the name of God as this binding duty for Christian worship. And it's not an option, it's an obligation. And then negatively, here's how not to use it. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God or you shall not take up the name of your Lord, your God, in vain. And it means up to lift up something to nothingness, meaningless, thoughtlessly. This can happen in a variety of ways, and the most obvious way we can think about is using God's name as a curse word, but it happens in other ways more subtle. For example, we take the name of the Lord our God in vain when we lift it up to nothingness, when we take it upon our lips thoughtlessly, when we sing his name while our minds and hearts are worried elsewhere, wandering around the world, when we pray his name, but we haven't really prayed. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, do we just go through the motions? They're very familiar words. In the traditional form, is this just routine? How easy it is to take the name of God in vain. To use his name on our lips, to call upon him with our words, but not to engage with our hearts. You know, in Shakespeare's Hamlet, the king, he confesses that reality in a way that we probably all know well. He said, my words fly up, my thoughts remain below. Words without thoughts never to heaven go. So when you come to worship, you must engage your heart as well as open up your mouth. How easily it is to misuse the name of God while sounding like you, uh, sorry, while sounding like you give him honor, but you don't. Christians are those who bear the name of God. For we have been baptized into the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we read in Matthew 28, 19. And John also writes in Revelation 14 and 1 and 22, 4, and he sees Christians with the name of God and with Christ written on their foreheads. We carry the name of God. It is, if you like, our family name. We bear the name of God before the world. And yet, as Paul reminds the Jews in Romans 2.24, who bear the name of God, whose lives they thoroughly con contradict that name, he says to them, because of you, God is blasphemed among the Gentiles. 
for your lips and your life contradict one another so that people around you mutter the phrase, what do they call themselves, Christians? Did you see what he did? Did you hear what he said? And that's the challenge of the third commandment. We also need to bear in mind the reaction of the Lord. For well, Jesus speaks about this in Matthew 7, 21. He reminds us, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy, prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I'll tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil words. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you who use this? Mankind, in an ultimate act of blasphemy, crucified Jesus. They lifted him up to worthlessness. I mean, they lifted him up to die on the cross. And the great irony of the Christian gospel, however, is that the same Jesus, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The third point we have today is the destinies of those who use God's name. There is a day coming when blasphemy will cease, and every tongue will acknowledge the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Some will confess it with joy as they enter into his presence forever, and some in great regret and shame as they are sent into the darkness of it. And so the question is pressed upon us by that third commandment. It's which destiny will be yours? The great irony of the Christian gospel is that those who deny and blasphemed and crucified him will one day discover that the denied and crucified Christ is made Lord and King. And the wonder of the Christian gospel is that the crucified, blasphemed and mocked Christ, the Christ who the world killed, died for the blasphemer and the murderer who takes his name in vain. Today, Jesus sits at the throne of God, reigning as Lord, wanting to be saviour of the believers. And today, there is still time to cease taking his name in vain and to come to know him for yourself. And so will you say, Lord, not merely with your lips, but confess your sin and believe with your heart as you acknowledge your need of him as your sin. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and we give thanks. We are so thankful that you've come first to us, as we read today in Matthew. Jesus was born, born to be the Savior, born to be the ultimate, clean, perfect sacrifice for us. We thank you for that. We thank you that we come under the name of Jesus, having accepted him as the Savior and Lord. We pray for those around us who do not believe Jesus Christ, that they may confess their sin to acknowledge you as Lord and Savior while there's still time. We would love to see them join us in your kingdom. And today we ask that they be awakened through the Holy Spirit, there be a blessing as they come and call upon the name of Jesus, praising Jesus, not using the name of Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.